All right, so my name is David Ahern, and I joined DigitalOcean last, what, last August, and almost immediately started looking at how to replace kind of a legacy bridge model for networking with XDP. And hit a lot of roadblocks, a lot of lessons learned, and I thought, you know, why not give a, a tutorial, share the code that I've created that shows how to do um, an equivalent setup to like an OVS um, networking, and then also share all the lessons learned that uh, the, the kind of the pain points that I picked up during that time of working on this code. So that's kind of the, the premise of the tutorial. And then set some context on what I mean by, you know, hypervisor networking. This is what a standard, a, a typical setup is for, for a host, host networking, where you've got two ingress necks into an LACP bond, and then the bond and all the tap devices for the virtual machines. So the virtual machines are using um, Bird.io net with tap plus vhost to have accelerated networking. And then all those tap devices plug into a bridge, whether it's Linux bridge or OVS. And so the idea is that packets coming in from the wire, most of them are gonna to go to the virtual machines. Maybe a few show up to host processes for Prometheus or system, system needs. And so you wanna get those packets from the network into the virtual machines with the least overhead as possible, right? So the intent is you want all the host cycles to be spent running virtual machines as opposed to processing packets for those VMs. So those of us who have been following NetDev know I, I'm an advocate for coexistence. Um, I don't think that everything should be rewritten in eBPF. I think you do the fast parts in XDP and you use the full stack for things like learning or um, bum traffic, any kind of, you know, whatever you want to label as unknown multicast broadcast traffic, um, have that be used the full stack to figure out where it needs to go. All right, so packet processing with XDP. XDP essentially bypasses all the networking stack. So the idea is you're running a program in the driver for that NIC, and the program can do something like a redirect to send the packet straight to a tap device. So the virtual machine that's gonna receive that packet. How that redirect decision is made is really up to the eBPF program or the system architect that's doing the networking for that node. So one thing you could do is have an FDB. So essentially tap into the bridge FDB and have it say, this uh, MAC address and this VLAN goes to this next device and have a redirect. Or you could use um, slash 32 host routing and use the FIB lookup helper that was added a few years ago to look at the network address and say, oh, well, this packet goes to this virtual machine. So the, the L2 kind of lookup doesn't exist today. There's an RFC for it as a way to tap into the bridge FDB. So for this tutorial, I'm just gonna make use of a map. And after creating this and seeing some of the performance numbers, I really think the map is gonna outperform anything that you can do by exporting a bridge helper. And there's gonna be use cases where you need the bridge to do the learning, to do the aging. And then there's gonna be use cases where you're in control of the HV. You know what VMs you're running on it. You know their network address, you know their MAC address. So you don't need learning. So in which case a static map to me seems like it's gonna make the most sense for something like uh, a cloud host. So for those who aren't familiar with, uh, with XDP or BPF, this is a per packet and per VM decision. So um, each packet that comes into the driver, this pro, you know, whatever program is attached to that net device gets run on each packet individually. Uh, and also VMs are untrusted. So a part of what you wanna do in XDP is not just say, well, a packet showed up at the HV, I'm gonna send it to this virtual machine you also need to validate what those VMs are sending. So that keeps them from spoofing source address, source max, for example, and polluting the switches, or um, pretending to be some other host on your, on your network. So part of what I'll get into is 
um, doing some validation of what packets of VMs are, are sending. Okay, so the host that I'm using, when I wrote the description for this tutorial back in like December, I was gonna do 5.4 kernel. Since the, the tutorial, the conference got delayed, tutorials delayed, it's a little more developed. And the 5.8 kernel has a feature in it that I need for this. So I shipped it over to the 5.8 kernel. It's a stock Ubuntu 18.04 um, operating system. The NICs are Mellanox Connect X4. Uh, it's a typical host networking configuration, like I mentioned, for the, the full stack. And then for the virtual machines, they can be on two different address, two different networks. So for example, they can have a public address or they can have a private address, in which case you're typically doing some kind of encapsulation like a VXLAN. And those packets would only go to other VMs in that tenant for that, for that tenant. And then of course the networking is tap plus vhost. So before I get into some of the details, I wanna remind everyone the directions for tap device. When a tap device is transmitting a packet or the TX path for a tap device, that's a packet going to the virtual machine. So from the host being transmitted to the VM. And then the RX path for a tap device is a packet coming from the virtual machine, coming into the host. And so the tap device is receiving it. So that gets important when you start thinking about um, what you're attaching and where. All right, so let's start by looking at host ingress traffic. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna describe some of the problem to be solved, and then I'm gonna switch screens and go into the code that you know, I've, I've written as a prototype for how to do some of the stuff. And then when I get through the three different descriptions, jump into an actual demo. So I'll have a host on our internal development network running all this code. Okay, so layer two forwarding. So the first thing you gotta do, packets coming into the host, is you're gonna attach a program onto ETH0 and ETH1. So that's the, the base um, ingress mix. So you can't do this on the bond because the bond doesn't do XDP. You want to do this on the Zingress NICs. We're going to attach a program which is going to use an FDB and a ports map. So the FDB is going to have a bunch of entries in it that are the VLAN and DMAC, destination MAC. And then the value that's going to return back is going to be a device index. So which, which net device is this packet going to? So the, the code for this, it's gonna be super simple. Um, packet comes in, you look at the ethernet header, you pull out the VLAN, you pull out the destination MAC, that's your key, look up in the FDB map. And then the ports map is used for two reasons. One of those is the redirect and the bulking effects that you get with it, as well as the error handling. And then the second one is gonna be, you can now as a 5.8, attach programs to dev map entries so that you can on the redirect run another program that is specific to the device going to receive the packet. All right, so the basic premise here is you're only doing fast path, takes XDP, slow traffic, goes up the full stack, and you gotta define known traffic. And so for me, I'm defining known traffic as an entry exists in the FDB, I'm gonna do a redirect. And if I can get almost all of the traffic that's going to virtual machines to bypass the host stack, um, it's a huge, amazing difference in performance in terms of the CPU cycles that the host has to spend moving that packet up. And I actually have a blog post that I should finish up this weekend and get published, which has some data that shows what the, the reduction in CPU cycles is. Okay, so we've got this program. It's gonna tap into a map. The FDB is a hash map. So that's a BPF map type hash. You know, I said before, the, the key is gonna be the VLAN and the DMAC. And then the value that comes back from that, if an entry is found, is going to be an index. So you have a user space component, user space program, which is going to, for example, as a VM gets started, the, a shell script or some agent can populate the FDB that says, here's a new VM, it has this tap device, 
it expects traffic going to this destination MAC and on this VLAN. The other, the other map that we're using is a ports map. And prior to, I think it's 5.4, the only option you had was dev map. So BPF map type dev map. And it was required at that time to have a map to do the redirect. Um, so the program returns XDP redirect. It uses this map as the acceleration piece of it, the bulking. Um, one problem that the dev map has, and so this is something you're gonna hit five dot or before 5.4, um, you have to declare your map size ahead of time. So if you think you're gonna have 200 VMs running on a host, for example, then you would wanna declare a map size of 200. But unfortunately, the index grows over time. So tap devices, for example, coming and going would grow over time. And so if you used your dev map index as your net device index, you would overflow it. So that 201st um, virtual machine gets started and you suddenly can't add that map entry. So for dev maps, you kind of have to use an intermediary map index where the FDB map doesn't return the map, doesn't return the device index, it has to return the map index. So that's gonna be the index that goes into the dev map, which then returns the correct device. So really what I'm saying here is the dev map was the first one and it has, it has some management aspects to it, which make it a little more complicated to use. And that was the motivation for the dev map hash, which came along in 5.4. And so for here, you don't need to do this inter intermediary mapping anymore. You can just use that device index. So the FDB map can return the device index, which is just the index into the dev map that the kernel is going to use to do the redirect. And then of course, 5.6, some more work done by Toke, which was getting rid of the need for the map altogether. And now you can just use BPF redirect directly, no map variant needed, no map part of it needed. Although there is a little bit of loss in error reporting. All right, so now let's kick over and look at what does it mean to write an L2 virtual switch in eBPF? So all of this code is available on GitHub. Um, I guess I should first ask, is this font size large enough? Is it coming across okay? Anyone? Yes. Looking good to me. Okay. All right. So all of this code is available on GitHub. It's in uh, my account is DSA Hern, and then there's a BPF Progs um, repository. And so all of all of this code that I'm going to show you here is available on that site. Um, so to walk through this, uh, usual kind of headers that you have to declare where things are defined. So the first thing we have here is our port map. And so again, since I'm on a 5.8 kernel, I'm gonna use a dev map hash. I'm gonna make my life easy, um, not having to deal with these intermediary, in, intermediary indexes. I size it at 512. That's way more than I think we would need, but I'm also having, I'm also gonna allow two different um, net devs per virtual machine. So a size 512 really means I'm allowing up to about 250, um, virtual machines with both a public and a private interface. And then the same with the FDB, it's gonna have that same size allowing individual Mac entries. Uh, moving into the program. So the first thing you have to do, so for XDP programs, the context that the program is passed is called XDP MD. And that defines, you have definitions in there for the packet start and the packet end. And you always have to verify that a particular point in the packet exists. And so that's what down here at line 52, I'm setting, oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, I define the ethernet header to be at the start of the packet. And the next header is going to be the, the point in the packet right after that ethernet header. And so at line 53, I have to check that yes, that next header exists, it's greater than the end of the packet so that my ethernet header exists. So at this point, I know that I can dereference the proto and the DMAC and pull those out of the ethernet header 
And if I didn't do that check, the verifier would reject the program saying it's, it's an unknown or it should be out of bounds checks. So you always have to verify something exists in a BPF program before you actually access it. Um, so in my case, I expect all the packets destined for a virtual machine to be VLAN tagged. So in this case, if it's not a VLAN tagged packet, I don't need to pay attention to it. So the program can immediately just ignore it and let the packet go up the full stack. So since I expect a VLAN header, I then use to find a VLAN struct. So V header is struct VLAN header. So again, I have to make sure that the VLAN header exists in the packet before I can look into it. And if it's not there, I'm gonna drop the packet because it seems like the packet would be malformed for it to show up with yeah. Ethernet. Yep. Is there a question? Okay. Um, so yeah, it, it would be a malformed packet if it had an Ethernet header, but not the VLAN header behind it if the, the type is VLAN. Um, so I can just do the drop here and maybe not let the full stack see it at all. Again, with BPF, you have to initialize everything before you access it. So I'm going to clear out the key, and then I'm going to set the VLAN key, VLAN part of the key, to be um, the TCI, the, the VLAN part of the TCI out of that VLAN header. And if, again, if the VLAN is not set, I know that's an invalid config for what I'm doing, in which case I can just return and let it go up the, the full stack. After that, I'm going to copy the destination MAC because my FDB is based off of VLAN DMAC, copy that into the key, and then do a lookup. If there's an entry in the map, I can, there's not an entry in the map, I can just return and again, let it go up the full stack. Or if the device index hasn't been set, I can let it just go up the full stack and let the, the kernel stack take care of it. So then after that, I did find an entry. And I'm gonna make sure that my ports map has an entry for this device index. If it doesn't, again, full stack. So this is where it gets into keeping the XDP program extremely simple and refined on fast path packet processing only. In any kind of unexpected conditions, just let the full stack take care of it. All right, so my, v, my virtual machines don't know anything about VLANs. They don't know that they're actually separated by, by VLANs. So since this program is being done in XDP and I'm gonna redirect that packet to the VM, I've gotta strip that header myself. So that's what this next part is doing, is removing the VLAN header. And this is effectively doing what the kernel has to do if VLAN acceleration is not on, which is moving that header um, forward. And then at the end, doing the redirect, handing off that packet to the kernel to do some bulking internally to send this packet to this net, to this, uh, net dev. So that's it. 90, 98 lines, including headers and everything else, definitions, to have a simple L2 switch within XDP. So they, this is not a lining switch, right? But it would be pretty trivial to add a lining uh, into this. I, say, say it again? It, it, it's not a lining switch, like it doesn't update its FDP table? No, no, it's not learning at all. So but it, could be, it should be easy to add. It should be easy to add, yeah? Um, it depends on how you want to do your management. So for example, someone posted patches to tap into the Linux bridges FDB table. Mm -hmm. And part of that got into a discussion about how's it, how does the learning part happen and the aging part happen? In my case, what I was saying earlier is this is a virtual machine host. It's not some random traffic forwarder. In this case, I know exactly which VMs are running on this host. Mm -hmm. so I can populate my FDB precisely. So you updated before, uh, up, there's some, I guess, yeah, separate tool. You're not using uh, the breach tool to update or no. netlink tool. It's not a shared table. No. Uh, you, you didn't show that part, but there's, I'm assuming there's a tool that updates the tables. 
Yeah, I've got a demo coming up where I will okay. walk through. So like you can start the virtual machine and pause it in a pause state, which allows the libvirt code, for example, to create the tap device, pass it over to QMU, but the VM's not running yet. And then you can have management scripts that come in and say, now that I have the tap device, I already know the MAC address and the network address being assigned to this virtual machine. I can now create that FDB entry. So cool. David, with the patches that are been floating on net next, yeah. the helper with static entries will work for you? I'm just curious if your other depot program actually- Yes, yeah, it could. It could, right? Okay. I strongly suspect for something like this use case where everything is known that the map is going to perform way better than tapping into the Linux bridge. Through the Linux API? Okay. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, it comes down to testing. So when the person working on that bridge part of it, when he gets that, that working, um, I can always update my, my experiments because I have both side by side. And okay. I can flip out OVS, go to Linux bridge, run one set of tests with Linux bridge, and then run another set of tests with with the FDB based. Um, I mean, it's just a matter of switching out the FTP program that's on there. Cool. So yeah, it's, yeah, we'll, we'll find out in time. Is this super simple um, XTP style, you know, using a hash map, static hash map, faster or slower, or, you know, or negligible. If it's negligible, there are benefits to using the Linux bridge. So just tap into it and let it do the, the learning. Yeah. All right. So that was, that's our virtual switch. So now we've got packets came into the host, go up to the VM, but we have a problem. And for those who are at the XTP workshop, I'm sure you heard me complaining about this yesterday. Um, if your NIC supports VLAN acceleration, the VLAN tag is getting stripped by the hardware. So all you're getting is ethernet frame. And then when it creates an SKB, it sets the tag separately. Well, the, what's passed to your XTP program is the packet. So you've lost the VLAN information. So you can't make, you can't make a VLAN based decision um, without with, with um, VLAN acceleration on. So you got to strip, you got, you got to turn off, uh, the VLAN acceleration so that you keep um, the tag in the packet. So essentially RX VLAN off is what you have to do for the devices that have it enabled. But then that means the program itself has to strip the VLAN header. But I showed that in my L2 forwarding program earlier. So that's also, I guess in my demo script, that's kind of a hidden behind the scenes thing. But that is one of those gotchas that you will be looking at TCP dump output, you know, like none of these packets to this host should show up on TCP dump on the bond and yet they're there. So you start questioning whether your program's doing anything. Well, it's just because the VLAN's missing. So keep that one in mind if you're in a VLAN environment. All right, so the next thing is packets came into the host getting redirected to the VM and often, um, at least for our case, uh, people running virtual machines on our hosts, they want an ACL implemented. They don't even want to see packets, um, certain kinds of packets. So for example, um, if it's not running a web server, there's no reason to send a, a packet destined to port 80 to the VM. There's no, no reason to even wake it up or make the guest OS deal with it. And so you want to have this ability to do on a per VM basis, a set of rules, which can limit traffic coming into that VM. Mm -hmm. And another thing you could do um, is validate the packet data. So, so far we've only looked at the destination MAC address and the fact that it's going to this tap device means that the DMAC and the tap or the VLAN and the DMAC show up as a known entry, but it doesn't mean the network address or other elements of the packet are valid. So if you wanted to, you could tap into that into the network header aspect of the packet and say, is the destination address the expected network address for this VM? And if it's not, drop the packet to keep 
unknown traffic from showing up to the VMs. Um, so this was something that, um, this capability was something I added in the 5.8 kernel. So the TX path for the tap device, remember these are packets being transmitted to the virtual machine. There is no XDP option. When you add an XDP program to a net device, it's being run on, on the RX side. So to get around this, you know, after looking at trying to do an egress option for XDP, the SKB path kept blowing things up and Daniel pushed this over to, well, let's just do a program entry, attach a program to the dev map entry as a way to have these per virtual machine or per net device um, type of programs. Uh, let's see, I think I just covered all of that. So one, one benefit, I, I reason why I was pushed in this direction is the cleanup side of it. Um, you could stack all these programs up on the ingress. So instead of just having a simple L2 switch on each zero and ETH1, you could have it um, do a tail map, a tail call into another program, which is a VM specific. I don't like that method because um, the management of it is more complicated and you don't get any kind of automated cleanup where if you attach a program to a dev map entry, the program ref count is tied to the device. And when the device is cleaned up, the entry is removed from the dev map by the kernel, which means the program ref count is also dropped. So you're getting some cleanup for free by associating a program that is unique to a VM, attach it to that VM's tap device. So that is a, that is a benefit for the dev map entries approach. All right. And so back to some more code. Um, I think it's this one. Yep. Okay. So same thing, all this code's available on the GitHub site. Uh, in this case, what I've got is a hash map again for the ACL entries. The ACL key is, I think I have that defined in this header. No. No, that's in a user space header. Uh, include. Oh, this one. Here we go. All right, I always forget to open up Windows. So the key is the port and protocol. And again, this is, there's a lot of shortcomings to this approach. So just take this as a very simplistic ACL. Um, I actually need to restructure it a bit because I was getting annoyed with something I was doing. But at the moment, what it's doing is saying, what is the transport protocol or the next protocol after the network? And then is there a destination port or a port? In this case, it's the destination port. Um, so that's gonna be the key that you would look up into this map. And then if there's an entry, it'll return this value, which is gonna be, maybe there's a source address set that says the source address has the match. Maybe there's a destination address match. And in my case, my ACL was actually used on the RX side and the TX side, which is why there's two different a source address and a destination address entries. The family for that address, uh, the flags gets into these up here. And it's really because of IPv6, I don't wanna do that comparison unless I know that it's been set. So that's kind of a little optimization on it. And then this is the other end of that port. So in this case, it would be the source port if I was checking on that. Okay, so that's the definition of the ACL hash map. This other map here is VM info. And so multiple programs need to have access to information about the virtual machine. So for example, the MAC address, the network address, IPv4, IPv6. And I didn't wanna replicate that information across each one of these programs. So what I'm doing is creating static map pinned into sysfs and it'll contain that information once and then that map will get referenced by all the other programs that need that information and so i'll get to that this part of the demo 
uh, from the code side of this. So one benefit to this eBPF approach is an XDP. You can have a program for XDP and a program for TC's classifier, both referencing, as you can see here, there's some tiny differences in the context, but you can have the same logic um, being executed from both an XDP path and a TC path. So for example, if I wanted this ACL to exist in one map, but being referenced by two different code places and attached to different places, but it's still the same information in the same code, um, this is a way to do that. So for example, the full stack, instead of having OVS take care of some of these matchings and, and limitations or restrictions on what, what traffic can flow up, I can have the ACL done for the slow path, have it done through a TC filter, right? And so that way I'm not duplicating anything from a, a data perspective. So that's what this part is, but we're gonna do the XTP part of it. And it's the same thing where you have your XTP MD is your context. You got a local variables for both the beginning and end of the packet area. So this is, this is a, uh, an entry on the redirect. And so because this is a dev map entry, I have access to the egress index, which is gonna be the device that I'm going to. So really the context in this case is gonna have both. I know the ingress device and I'll know the egress device. So I get to see where it's came from and where it's going to inside this, inside this program. Um, the first thing I do here is I look up in that VM info map and I say, do I have an entry? Because if I don't have an entry, something's not right and I'm gonna let this go up the full stack so that if the program's doing any validation, the full stack can take care of it because I don't have the information here. And then after that, I'm gonna, my generic drop packet hook for deciding if the pack, this packet needs to be dropped or if it's continue on its path to the virtual machine. And then the difference here for the TC and XTP pads are the return codes, shot versus drop from the XTP side of it. So the drop path, drop packet piece of that um, is in this. So it's an ACL. So I don't like duplicated code. And so anytime I'm referencing code from two different programs, I tend to put it in header files. And so that's what this ACL VM common is. It's the actual logic piece of it that's being used from both the RX and the TX paths. All right, and let's see, this, this here is where it starts and the rest of that code up above is things like just helper functions for comparing IPv6 addresses, for example. So the first thing you gotta do again is you gotta check and say, does the data exist? Because if it doesn't exist, then you have a malformed packet and the verifier is gonna reject the program. So once I verify that the header after the ethernet header exists, then I can go ahead and use it. I can start referencing things like inside the ethernet address, I can reference the source Mac or the destination Mac where I'm verifying that in fact, and again, this is common code. So that's why it's being, seems somewhat duplicate to verify when I've already done it on the redirect. Um, but again, it's being run from possibly from an XTP path and a TC path and then an RX and TX side of it, all sharing the same, same code. So compare the MAC address. It's what I expect in the packet. Look at the, oh, making sure I stripped off any ethernet, any, any VLAN headers. And then I get into a packet parsing. So this was something else that came up recently was someone, I think it was at Intel, was talking about giving access to the kernel slow dissector from BPF programs. And I've got um, a packet parsing code in my repository here, which it's modeled after the flow dissector, but it's trying to be a modular for XDP so that you can always keep track of, if you're not doing IPv6, for example, compile out IPv6. If you're not doing, if you're not interested in transport header information, then you can not parse that piece of the packet. So 
I'm going to jump over here to this next screen. Uh, just to, to that point, Dave. Yeah. So, um, so I, I think that's a good, great idea to only have only what you need to use, right? If you're just you're not interested in VLANs, what why the heck are you parsing VLANs or right? Uh, which the flow dissector doesn't know how to do, uh, and that's that's one thing that makes Flower slow actually uh, on the ingress path because it does generic full packet parsing. It does the whole goddamn thing, and then they use that as a key to to do a lookup. The right. Question to you is, uh, could this have been, say, downloaded as a, an extension program, say, an eBPF program that uh, just pass all, all I need, as opposed to, uh, maybe I should wait until I see your code first. So this is where you start doing eBPF. It's got to be one continuous flow, right? And so it's got to be a standalone program. You can do a tail call where you jump to another program, but again, right. it's got to be a linear flow. So this idea of having generic library code that you would call into it and come back, um, as far as I know, it has it doesn't exist yet. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about it. Yeah, so that's why I was making this as a kind of a generic struct, again, modeled after, but I want to have all of the enable pieces in here so that, for example, you can include this flow.h header file in your code, your, your specific targeted program, and then that targeted program would enable some of these features, right? So if it didn't care, if it, if it did want IPv6, then it would do this define to make sure the IPv6 code is included. And if it didn't care about it, then it wouldn't define it and it wouldn't be bothered with it, right? So it's keeping- So it, it won't be compiled in, is that what it is? Right, exactly. Okay. Exactly, so if you go back to this um, ACL program, right? So it includes the ACL VM common and then common includes the flow. And so theoretically, right, here. Theoretically, right before this, I just got kind of lazy in my, when I started adding the enable functions. Um, right here at line 27 is where it should be saying, these are the things I want from this flow.h. Right, that's the direction I want to see the code go. And so that when this ACL program is compiled for a specific use case, it only includes what it needs. And it's, it's really going after, again, that XDP notion of XDP is about advanced networking. And it's about you only do what you know you need for that use case, right? So if you're not doing any kind of policy routing, if you're not doing any kind of, you know, IPv6 or trans whatever the code is, you're strictly focused on what you need to make it as fast and light as possible. Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh... The appliance model, basically. You just build the appliance you want, not to have it modular. Yes. Right? But you can do it through modular code. So again, like this, this flow code here, um, it's set up generically to enable this, and then you do the if defs. You, you define the the things you want in, right? And so when the program's compiled, it's just what you want. That that's what I would like to see from from a, what I when I call modular code. That's what I'm referring to. So the ACL code was calling parse packet and it's gonna fill in this flow struct. And the first thing it's gonna look at is that ethernet protocol to say, well, what, what is it? And in this case, let's say it's an IPv4 packet. It's gonna jump to the parse IPv4. Parse IPv, IPv4 is now the IPv4 specific code that you're gonna get into. And so again, you always have to verify, does the IP header exist before I can dereference it? Um, always do some sanity checks on packets. You know, don't believe what showed up on the wire. So yes, it's IPv4, it's a version four packet. The header length is what I expect. Um, and then start filling in that flow information. And so again, allowing things like, I don't care about transports. Right. So if you had a use case that said you only want the source address or the destination address, you would stop parsing the packet right there in return. Because whoever called this flow parser was only interested in that one specific set of data, meaning 
the, trend, the, the next protocol, the source address, and the destination address. Uh, let's see. So if it were to continue, then again, you got to move that next header pointer beyond the IPv, IPv4 header. And of course, well, then I'm going to jump to the parse transport code, but it's going to do the first thing it has to do is validate that the header exists. So in this case, the transport can be TCP, UDP, ICMP, or ICPv6. I clearly have some defines that are missing. Anyway, TCP header, for example, first thing you have to do is again, make sure that the header exists in the packet before you go and look into the header um, entries to make sure they exist, to make sure the header exists. And then that right now is all I have for parsing TCP, UDP, it's just pulling out the ports, right? So if other people want to pick this up and continue extending it, and again, making it that modular piece, I would like to see something like this over tapping into kernel code. All right. So just, just sort of interjection. So Tom, Tom yeah. Hubbard has a talk on Monday where he is probably going to, I haven't seen the paper or anything, but this is the kind of stuff he wants to make modular. Uh, now, I, anyway, th that would be a good discussion to have. There. Okay. All right, so now we go, we went down this rabbit hole of parsing the packet, and that's what this function was here, this call here. So now I have a flow struct, and like I said, my, my key to my ACL map is a simple protocol destination port. And create the key, do a map lookup, do I have an entry? If I don't have an entry, nothing to do, move along. Um, so again, everything below here, it's basically just saying, am I dropping the packet or keeping it? I can't say I really like where it exists today, but it's, it's a thought, it's an idea. Um, so again, if, if people have uh, better ideas on how to do an ACL, you know, certainly send patches. All right, so I think at that point, we've parsed the packet, we've decided if there's an ACL entry for it, we're going to return back whether we're keeping it or dropping it. And then that decides what the program is going to do from a drop or a pass perspective. If it's pass, then it goes on to, um, in this case, since it's a redirect path, it's going to be added to the bulking um, queue inside the kernel. And then when that's flushed, all those packets get pushed up to the ton device. All right, I think that was it for this path. Okay, so we've packets have come in to the host, been redirected to the virtual machine. The other piece of that is gonna be from a host perspective, is traffic coming out of the virtual machine and going out of the host. So like I said before, virtual machines are untrusted um, entities. So every packet coming out of that needs to have source MAC checked, network address checked to make sure that they're not trying to spoof something. Um, again, allowing um, for some kind of an egress ACL. In this case, it's gonna be more like a cloud provider saying, I don't need people using my VMs or my hosts to uh, send junk mail. So for example, maybe you don't wanna allow SMT traffic, SMTP traffic. So in which case the host has this, this ACL that applies to anything coming out of the VM, that would just say, if this is if this is SMTP, just drop it. I don't need to deal with it. Um, and then if everything passes, whatever it checks the, the host wants to do, then redirect that traffic the packets over to um, the host egress NIC. But now one problem we have here is the bond, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, if it's an unknown destination MAC address, again, allow us to take the slow path to go through the bridge and the bond to figure out what needs to happen with it. And as with the dev map entry, in this case, the eBPF program is going to be attached to the tap device itself. So this is a normal device attachment for XD, XDP, and it's the RX path again, packets being received by the host from the virtual machine. And then when that tap device gets deleted, 
the VM's program gets deleted. So I really, I really like that cleanup model. Okay, so the bond. Bond doesn't do a XDP, and you have to tell an actual egress device, right? You have to direct either to ETH0 or ETH1 in this setup. So which leg do you use? So I looked at the bond policy and trying to create a BPF helper for it. And for simple ones like active backup, it was easy to export a helper to say, you know, let it tell you which leg to use. But for L3, L4 hashing, it meant converting an XTP frame into an SKB equivalent, like someone was proposing for um, the hash access, or just replicate the code. And, or, I'm sorry, or modify the bond code to work with XTP frames. And after looking at that for a couple of days, I'm like, that's, there's no return on the investment. And so what I really figured out was, you know, it's not that complicated of a code, it's just easier to replicate that algorithm in UEPF. And so while I don't like duplicating kernel code, I would prefer to have helpers. Um, I think this is one of those areas where it's, when you're trying to pick what is the best long-term solution, it was just easier to replicate that code in VPF. And I'll show that in a few minutes. Uh, the other thing to remember about this egress path, um, you don't get VLAN acceleration. So you got to insert the VLAN tag yourself, the VLAN header yourself onto that packet before you do the redirect. And offloads. Yeah, they don't work. So if the virtual machine is expecting to be able to use TSO or checksum offload or any of those kind of things, it doesn't work. So what you have to do is you can either tell the guest, hey, please turn this off if you want your networking to work, or you go into live virts config and you say, here's the things you need to turn off so that the VM doesn't even know exists, right? So it, it's going to do its detection and go, well, I, don't, I can't rely on hardware offloads. I will take care of this myself. So one of those lessons learned about why does ping work, but SSH sessions into the VM drops. Uh, another gotcha for the egress path is CPUs. So on large systems, so with XDP, the way the queues work is it's per CPU to keep it lockless. And the redirect is going to happen on some CPU and it goes into an XDP queue inside the NIC driver. But if the NIC driver doesn't have a queue for that CPU, it just drops the packet. So if it's a smaller system and you've got like the Mellanox card with 64 or 63 queues, you're probably doing okay. You just gotta make sure you have the number of queues set up properly, which are the tool commands are there. Um, but if you have more than 64, you gotta be very careful about where the vhost threads are running. And I can tell you again, from it's baffling to figure out everything's working fine with that virtual machine. And then all of a sudden traffic just stops and then it'll start working again. And it's strictly because the VHOS threads are being moved around by the process scheduler. So you know, there's not really a good solution to this one. You gotta go look up through proc interrupts um, where the CPU, which CPUs have queues associated with it and then affine the vhost threads to those set of CPUs. All right, so going back to code. Uh, it's this one. All right. So similar to the program that was attached to ETH0 and ETH1, you got to have a device map, which tells you which ports you can redirect to. Um, Anytime you see an underscore underscore in one of my programs, there's a potential that I have a shell script that's going to overload it. So essentially what's happening is, and I'll get to this in my demo script, BPF tool is going to create a map and pin it. And then it's going to, when I load the program using again, BPF tool, um, it's going to replace this map definition with this global one so that everybody can use the same map and I don't have to have these multiple dev maps running around. I can have one that defines everything. Uh, same thing goes here with this ACL map. One set of code for 
all the virtual machines, but then each instance of the program can have its own map. And so again, I'll, I will use BPF tool to create a map and pin it so they can have access to it to add entries and remove entries and then attach that map, that instance to the, to the program on load so that I can have unique instances. Um, so anyway, dev map hash again, because you're going to be doing redirects, the ACL very, it's exact, exact same code for the RX or traffic coming out of, this is where it gets really confusing with that tap device because TX means to the VM, RX means from the VM, but really we're talking about traffic that's going out of the host. But anyway, um, the ACL code is exactly the same. So I'm not going to go over that again. And the same with this VM info, it's the exact same map that was set up earlier. So unique to this VM egress path is this bond hash. Um, as I mentioned earlier, tapping into the kernel's code for the bond got to be a bit painful. And as you can see here, the algorithm is really not that complicated to, if you use the flow dissector to get the addresses and get the ports, just do the quick hash on it and pick a leg based on that. Uh, in terms of the program itself, again, it looks up in that VM info map that says, is this virtual machine known to this global map that so I can validate information? Because uh, that, that uh, VM info is passed to the drop packet program, which I went over earlier. Um, a quick catch on any kind of broadcast frames, like I don't want ARP packets to get redirected. Let's send those down the slow path. Um, and then I got to push my VLAN tag on, since this is an FTP program, can't rely on, on the uh, hardware acceleration piece of that. Pick the leg based on the hash, bond hash, and then do the redirect. So this egress program has a lot of similarities with the ingress in the sense of uh, parsing the packet, um, doing an ACL check, in this case, pushing a VLAN header instead of stripping the VLAN header and then doing the redirect to a specific um, net device. All right, demo time. I guess I didn't have to come back to uh, the keynote just for that. So now I'm gonna flip over to this is an server in our uh, development lab. So again, I'll ask, is this font size big enough? Okay, I will take that as a yes. Same thing, the, the demo script is inside this repository. So you can, if you're on GitHub now, you can see it, it's right here. Um, it has a bunch of print statements in here. So I, as I walk through this program, it'll, I'll describe what's going on. But if you want to see the whole thing, it's again, right there on GitHub. All right, so let's go through the script. And I do want to show this. So this is going to be TCP dump running on the bond device. And you'll be able to see when the VM gets started. Uh, you'll be able to see none of the packets are going through it when I log into the virtual machine. So kind of showing that it's the XTP fast path going around the bridge and the bond. Oops. All right. So let's start the script. So the first thing I'm doing is showing. Uh, all right. So it cleaned up. There were some leftovers from my uh, previous attempt to make sure this demo doesn't fail. It's never failed yet when I've done it, um, but you always got to be careful about it. Okay, so the first time I invoked it, it reset the system. It made sure VXLAN, RX, VXLAN, RX VLAN is disabled in hardware. It made sure none of the programs were loaded, any of that kind of stuff. So that's what I'm showing here is I've got no XTB programs, no TC programs. None of those maps I was discussing earlier exist now, and so I'm going to walk through those. All right, so the first thing I do is create that virtual machine, the virtual machine map. 
that's what this is. So it gets a little tough with a font size and sharing. Okay, so the first thing it's doing is creating that virtual machine info map. And it's that global map that's pinned in SysFS. And by the way, I'm using BPF tool here because it's easy to show kind of a step-by-step. -step. Um, in reality, I wouldn't use this if I was making this to be a production system. I would have all of these things done internally by some agent running on the box. But that's kind of a boring demo for me to just say, look, here's a process. And then all of a sudden, XDP is running. So the point of the BPF tool steps here is to be able to walk you through step by step what's happening. Okay, so like I said, creating the VM info map and 500 entries, it's going to be all that global information about the virtual machines, creating the dev map entries, the dev map, which allows me to forward or redirect packets from ingress NICs on the host up to a tap device or from the tap device down to the, uh, the host NICs. So that's what the XTP forward ports map is. And you can see those with this map show. It's listing both of those maps with their IDs. And then since again, I'm using this to redirect VM traffic, I go ahead and add entries into the forward ports map for both ETH0 index two and ETH1, which is index three, which again, this is another reason why you'd wanna do this to an agent as opposed to BPF tool because having to go manually hard code index two is ETH0 and index three is ETH1, you'd really wanna do that through lookups as opposed to having to hard code the hex values there. Loading the program, that XTP uh, L2 forward program, it's been compiled and in my repository, I have things in case source object and then source bin is the other path. Um, it's, this is where it's gonna pin or load the program to this point in SysFS. This is what I meant by redoing those maps. Uh, so I've created that global map and now this is gonna be what attaches that global instance to this program's reference of a forward ports map. The next thing I do is attach that uh, uh, L2 forward program to both ETH0 and ETH1. You can see the map listings. Now you can see the FTP map show up. You can see the program, the XDP, XDP L2 forward program shows up and it's referencing both that FTP map, which is ID 50, and the forward ports map, which is 47. And then the last thing this is showing is, yep, that program 61 is attached to ETH0 and ETH1. Next thing I do is I start the virtual machine. If you remember, I said I need the tap device to be able to do VM specific entries in the FDB, for example, and the forward ports map but I don't want the VM to be able to send traffic until I'm ready for it. So start it paused, that gives me the tap device. At that point, I can add an entry into that VM info map that says for this ID, which is a unique thing to, to DigitalOcean, it has this tap device, it's on this VLAN with this MAC address, has this network address for IPv4, and this network address for IPv6. So all that information goes into this global map. And my virtual machine also has a VPC tap device. So now I have a second entry um, unique to it. And so if I print that virtual machine info map, I can get that information back. So yep, everything looks good from, from the, that map's perspective. Next is to create that so the ACL that's going, packet's going to the VM, I create this virtual machine specific map. I'm pinning it in SysFS just so I can get access to it later when I load the program. Um, and so now at this point, I've got a map for both RX and TX, and I can start adding entries. These are unique entries specific to this virtual machine. So just to give some examples of that, 
In this case, like I said earlier about blocking SMT traffic, SMTP traffic, um, just for giggles, blocking port 80 going into the virtual machine. And then same thing on, or I'm sorry, this is coming out of the virtual machine. And then the next one down here is traffic going to the virtual machine. So both of these entries are preventing a virtual machine, some process in the VM from talking to port 80 on the web. And then the same thing, something on the web can't come in and, and point to port 80 on this virtual machine. And again, this was just kind of examples of how to do ACL entries. All right, and that was a lot of data. So next up is loading the ACL programs that are gonna reference those maps I just created and then attaching those programs to this VM's tap device. So again, using VPF tool, this is the object file that it's loading. It's gonna pin it to this point in the sysfs directory. And if you remember that VM info name, that underscore underscore, it's getting replaced by this real map that exists, okay? So this is where the object code has a reference to a map, but I'm gonna override that with one out of one that already exists. And then the same thing with the TX map. I'm gonna take the program's reference and swap it out with one that I've already created and populated with entries. And then similarly with the VM egress program, I load that program, pin it in SysFS, swap out some of these um, maps. So instead of it pointing to a specific uh, program specific map, I'm gonna have it point to this global map. Same thing with the VM info and the ACL. So at this point, all these programs are ready. They, I can attach them to this VM's tap device. And this is a map listing, which is gonna show the TX map has been created, the RX map has been created, and I need to figure out why that's created and created. That shouldn't be there. Okay, the next thing it's showing is the program listing. So remember earlier, this was the program attached to each zero and each one. And then I showed you the ACL program that's getting loaded as a dev map entry has both an XTP and a TC hook to it. And so that's what those entries are here from a program listing. And you can see that it's referencing maps 46 and 51. So 46 is that VM info map and 51 is this VM's specific TX ACL map. And then similarly for the packets coming from the virtual machine, this XTP egress program, this instance is referencing maps 46, 52, and 47, which again become the global VM info map, the VM specific RCL, ACL RX map, and the redirect map, so the forwarding forward ports map. And when I do the net show now from BPF tool, I see each zero's map, I mean, each zero has a program loaded, ETH1 has a program loaded, and now this tap device has a program loaded. At that point, the VM can be released. It can finish spinning up, and I add the dev map entry. So this is the FDB entry. Sorry, this is the dev map entry. So when the packets are coming into the host and they get redirected to this tap device, this is the F. Yeah, this is the FTB entry, sorry. <laughs> Getting all these things confused. Um, and then it's gonna run this program on that redirect. And so when I take my user space program, which can dump the FTB entries, this is what it's gonna show. This is what it has for the FTB, which is the VLAN and destination Mac goes to this VM's tap device. And then when I dump the XTP ports map, I can see that it has an entry for ETH0, ETH1, and the VM's tap device. 
with a program attached to it. So any redirects to two and three don't have a program. Any redirects to this tap device will have program 67 run on it. All right. And so now we can see some traffic coming through. This 67 is that VM's address. And so I'm going to log into that VM. Didn't test this earlier. All right, this is where you oops, look away because I forgot to go in and disable the um, checksum offloads on the virtual machine. So I will have to do that manually here. Let's see if I can spell the tool. All right. So now I can log in. And so you get that validation that I wasn't kidding about the, the offloads. So if you don't have those, if, you, if you're letting the guest expect the, the hardware offloads to kick in, it's going to fail. And you see where I had to go in and disable those to be able to log into the virtual machine. Um, so one of the things I mentioned was blocking port 80. So if I were to try to go to google.com, for example, it's going to fail. I can go to 43 or 443, so the HTTPS version of that, but I can't get to um, the ACL in the host is blocking me from getting out, going out to, to straight up port 80. Uh, So just to show you that it works, so I'm going to undo, I'm going to remove that FDB entry from the map. And so now when I print this, there's nothing there. And you're going to start seeing, yeah, you see this traffic going to the VM, right? So showing you that when there's an FDB entry, it takes a fast path. When I remove that FDB entry, it's taking the slow path and going through, going through the bond. All right. Anybody have questions on the, the demo side of that? Does it all seem straightforward? This seems as a question on the chat line by uh, Anton. I don't know if Anton wants to talk or you can read or I can read for you. Let's see. Does it handle connection tracking? Um, no. That is an open item, is to figure out what the best course of action is for connection tracking. One option would be to tap into NetFilter. Um, another option would be to kind of write your own um, I know there's been a few people who have looked into it to kind of figure out what is a good way to, to have connection tracking with an XTP. I don't think there's any consensus on how to do that yet. I think the question may be, what is, uh, what is connection tracking in this case, right? Is it if you kept, uh, if you kept uh, source destination IP protocol state, which you can learn very easily, you can create a hash map that stores it, right, dynamically. Yeah. Lands it, basically. Is that good enough? Or do you need all that uh, fancy thing looking at TCP acts and all that stuff? Right. So yeah, this is where we've had discussions about what a good way to do connection tracking, um, or even have a, a fancier ACL. It's 
I've been focusing more on what was needed from getting the efficient forwarding paths going and also the cleanup aspects of it that I haven't spent a whole lot of time getting into um, a proper ACL implementation. So I get what you're saying now about you want to allow all the outbound traffic, but you only want to allow inbound uh, SSH sessions, for example. It's completely doable. It's just a matter of how you'd express that from an ACL perspective. So for example, the flow parser could easily look at um, TCP headers and look at and mark packets that are sends and allow those through and then for, for port 22, but then block everything else. Um, or you could have full blown connection tracking where you keep track of what connections exist and you know only allow new connections to port 22. You know, all that it's doable. I mean, we have it for NetFilter, we have it in other other places. Um, it's just a matter of someone either writing it themselves in EVPF or figuring out how to tap into the existing kernel facilities to do it. I, I, I'm not sure if you need kernel facilities to answer what uh, he needs. If you can track, if you can share the table between the ingress and the egress, and then populate the table on the outgoing packets, and then ingress looks uses that you know your actual table looked very simple, but mm -hmm. if you, you could you could break it down and make it something that gets populated at runtime by outgoing packets, right? Yeah. And then on incoming, you you, you use a, a key source destination IP port, and only allow it if a packet has come out of the of the host, right? Yeah, and, and the XDB program can also, you know, you could have a bigger hash map for the, di the different ACLs. And you could have the XDB program itself say, I've seen this packet, I'm gonna log an entry here and deny others, you know? Like you, you can do that, all that within EVP app and using the maps. It's just a question of, yeah, I think really it's someone sitting down and figuring out what the right way to do. So there was a question about disabling TSO on the guest. Um, i trying to remember what comments I have coming up. So the workshop yesterday, I can tell you that, oh, I will get into that. I get into a different, there's two different problems coming up. So in this case, it's the disabling Texom and TSO for gas. So it can't rely on the hardware to segment stuff. I have played around with Mellanox driver and enabled the checksum options so that it always took care of this on its own. And it's possible. So again, this is something I brought up yesterday, which is people need to spend more time thinking about um, the TX path of it and what's needed to, to leverage some of the hardware acceleration pieces. Um, it is kind of a hard sell to have to disable hardware acceleration features to use a software acceleration feature. I think that's why right now I see the biggest gains for packets going to a VM. And I think once we get the checksum and the TSO piece, which Jesper is referencing the multi, multi buffer work, once that side goes in, I think you'll start seeing much, much a bigger improvement on host cycles when you can keep all this hardware stuff on as opposed to what you do today, which case you don't really see that much additional gain from the TX path, from the VM egress path. So I guess the short answer there is some more work is needed to really get the full benefit of it. Um, so the throughput trade-off. I haven't done a whole lot of tests yet on packets coming out of the VM. So right now I've been focusing on the benefits of packets being delivered to a virtual machine and using XDP to go around the host stack. So your answer about Disabling guest TSO trade-off. I think we'll find that out hopefully within, you know, what there's multi-buffer support has been proposed. If we can get that usable and start doing some benchmarks on it to get that data. Um, preserve offloads if we're running this in TC ingress. Yes, but you don't get the full benefit. If you're using the TC hooks, and that's part of why I started changing all my programs to do both TC and XDP was so that I can 
do performance tests. Again, same code, same logic, same everything, but I get the test XDP gains versus the TC um, classifier path. And it's just not as much, you know, there's not as much of a, of a kick from going to the EVPF route, or at least from what I've seen so far. All right, I think I just have a couple of more slides here. And the last area I wanted to touch on is, and this is where I got confused by that question about the TSO CSUM because there's another problem coming up. You wanna run XDP inside the virtual machines, right? So this is another part of the, the bigger cloud host problem with XDP. There are two major problems for using XDP inside of a virtual machine when the KVM is using VertIO.net as the um, NIC type. So if you try to attach a program and you get this error message back, XDP expects header data in a single page. Odds are, and I'm not gonna say this is always the case, but it's been the case for the ones I've had control of and can go look at the host side, your machine type is too old. So for example, LiveVert is using a 1.5 machine model. And if you bump that up to 4.1, you'll get past that error message. And you will actually get to the next problem, which is you try to load a program and it says too few TX rings available. The problem is you have to have a multi-queue NIC for the virtual machine. And what that means is however many virtual CPUs the machine has, you need twice that many queues on that NIC if you expect to load an XTP program to it. And that applies to every tap device that you want to load a BPF program on. Another problem that comes in, so let's say you get past that, you have the right machine model, you have the right um, number of queues that goes with the, the virtual machine. Um, the next problem you're gonna hit is the guest performance dramatically drops. So for example, as a lot of this benchmark testing I've done, um, I wanna drop packets in the host as soon as possible because the only thing I wanna measure is what it takes to get a packet from the wire into the VM and then have the guest drop it. The problem is as soon as I loaded an XTP program inside the VM, everything changed because VertIO.net is telling QMU I think, it's, I think this is the path. VertiNet tells QMU to disable TSO and TX checksum on the tap device. So these packets are coming in, and as soon as it hits the tap device, the host has some extra work to do before it can actually push those packets up to the VM. And so the performance measurements completely changed. So something to keep in mind, and I don't know why, I was really surprised by this one, I don't know why, it has to disable that because if I'm doing XDP, for example, for the redirects, um, I shouldn't have to disable that. And if I'm doing SKBs coming up, um, that's a normal path up the stack. So why does an XDP program inside the VM affect what has to happen on the host? So if someone has an answer to that, I was really confused but I'm just throwing this out here as that warning to others about what's, what's happening behind your back. All right, so like I mentioned earlier, I'm writing a blog post. I've been working on this for a while. I'm gonna finally, I publish it this weekend. This is kind of a telling graph behind it. So this data is collected using that demo script where it's putting the forwarding program on eat zero eat one doing the ACL entries, so it's parsing the packet from a flow perspective to look for ACL entries to do verifications. And when you look at the amount of work that the host has to do to push packets from the wire into a virtual machine, you can see that with XDP, it is much less than any kind of full stack like OBS has to do. So in this case, with XDP, I actually hit the limits of my packet generating setup as opposed to OVS where I could saturate it and couldn't do anything more like packets were getting dropped on either host ingress, VM ingress, or what was the other one? I forget now, 
But anyway, packets were getting dropped everywhere with OVS because it was just completely saturating the CPU with, with uh, handling all the packets coming in. So XDP has its huge benefits, and I'm sure Jesper could probably answer this one, but there is this sweet spot around 50K to 500K packets where XDP seemed to be almost flatlined. And doing perf reports, for example, it just seemed like there was, I don't know if it's bulking efficiencies or something's kicking in where the kernel didn't, it wasn't continuing to take on more and more work as it took on more and more packets. And it's super repeatable. So I would expect anyone who wants to play around with, with this could take my scripts, download that repository, compile it in your kernel version, update the VM information in the top of that demo script. It should be able to run it on your local machine and see the same kinds of um, setup. See, see, see the same setup that I'm doing on this machine here. At least that was the point of this, this demo and the tutorial and pushing everything to GitHub. So one final set of comments. Um, same things people have to keep in mind about bypassing the full stack with XDP. Um, you are losing things like some of the software features that have been put in over the years, like RPS, so the packet steering, where you're distributing packets across all the CPUs for, for handling. And then also part of that's the flow steering and any kind of advanced or accelerated flow steering with that, which is the hardware offload piece of that. So with XDP, you are 100% relying on packet distribution within the hardware, if that matters to you. And then as, I, as we discussed earlier, um, you're bypassing the bridge so if bridge learning is relevant, then maybe this BPF helper that, that uh, someone was, was looking into might be a better solution for you than doing something like um, a static map where you're hard coding the entries. And then the other one that was unfortunate with XDP, we don't have access to hardware timestamps. So for example, I've written a program where the hardware timestamps the packets and I look at how long it takes, like latencies, to deliver those packets to the ton, it's a handoff to the ton driver or the socket side of the ton driver, we're tending it off to the virtual machine to get a sense of what latency the host stack is introducing. And with XDP, you lose access to those PTP timestamps to be able to do those kinds of analysis. I know that was brought up yesterday as well as something we gotta figure out how to get those kind of capabilities in, into the metadata, I guess. And that was all I had. So any questions? You have you a bunch on the chat line. Okay. All right, um, 10X. Okay, let's see. Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely on the, the EPPF programs and the ACLs. Uh, like I said, I have spent minimal time looking at the ACL side of it. I've been more focused on forwarding and getting features and, and data from that side of it. But also knowing that ACLs are going to require things like packet parsing. And so I want this to be a little bit of a fair comparison with OVS in the sense of I want the programs to do something. So that's why I added in the flow, the flow parsing and the ACL lookups was to have the programs doing some extra work to make it a little better OVS XDP comparison. Uh, and the comment about VertIO net disabling offloads. Yeah, it, what's confusing to me is the fact that these are packets that are coming through the host and going to the VM. So why does that part need to be disabled just because there's an XTP program on, on, the ta or on the NIC inside the guest? The host already has the packet and the host is already ready to deliver it. Um, I guess the TSO side of that would be to keep it from having large packets coming in. Um, I guess that would get into the 1500 MTU limitation or 4K limitation that exists today for XDP programs. Um, the checksum piece of that, yeah. Okay, yeah, I guess I could explain it. 
All right. Are there any other any other questions? All right. So again, codes on GitHub, please, you know, take a look at it, try it out. Um, you know, maybe, maybe Andre, I see you're attending. Uh, do something equivalent to the, the route case where you did some experiments showing, you know, the benefits of an XTP based router. This was really looking at it from an L2 perspective. And, um, so, yeah, I think you usually see similar results for that. Yes. All right, and again, it's on GitHub. So uh, if you, anybody has suggestions on changes, feel free to propose it, send pull requests. Um, yeah, hope you find it useful. Thank you.